now I had gigs like in big sporting arenas, you know, stadiums and stuff like that. I knew the name of every arena in the country. We got a gig tonight at the Spectrum in Philly. We'll be at the Forum. Gig tomorrow night at the Garden. That's where we played. I have your shoes selling them all out. She was very good. Audience loved her. Records sold. She was on an uphill swing all the time. When we did that tour together, we'd take turns closing and opening. <laughs> you know, try following Linda Ronstadt every night. I went to go see her at the Universal Amphitheater when she was wearing her Boy Scouts outfit and it was just rocking. Lynn was able to be really feminine and sexy in this world of men and somehow hold on to herself and do that and use that in the best possible way. There was a lot of dudes running around the stages then, you know, but we were on the road with Linda and killing it. She was killing every night. I know they liked my singing and I know they were proud of what they were doing, but still in rock and roll, the idea that you're actually working for a chick singer, in their way, they sort of saw it as not as cool as if they were their own rock and roll band and they were just all the guys. There weren't a lot of women musicians, so it was always a, a band of guys, you know. There weren't women bass players and women guitar players, and sometimes some of these guys were, they were tough. I got a lot tougher and more foul-mouthed. I used to swear a lot. I mean, I used to talk like a truck driver. When I think about the way I used to talk, I'm shocked. Without having any other girls along on the road, just automatically, you start to imitate them. Linda was never comfortable being on the road, but obviously she she did her job, and and part of her loved it. Who wouldn't love it? But I think there was another part of her that went, you know, this doesn't feel right. If I were going to choose something to do, it would not be to stand up in front of a lot of people. But I love to sing. I love to sing. I love music. So at some point, you do whatever you have to do to do music. She would confess to me that if she saw people in the front row, right, and somebody leans over and says something to the person next to them, she thought they were saying, you know, this, she's the worst singer I've ever heard. I don't like this. She really believed that. You get on the bus at night, card game going on, everybody blasting music or everyone else drinking, you know, a lot of drugs around. A lot of people would go on stage completely hammered, completely. Hammered. Everybody was up at night, and when the gig ended, you don't go home and have milk. It was kind of the nighttime danger, fun part about not having to go to bed. You know, Keith Richards can do it, so can I. Linda's thing was diet pills. She went through a phase, mostly taking speed and not eating and being super skinny. It seemed like it was so hard to be out there day after day after day and to try to get up the energy to sort of do that when you were just wrung out from the, the sense of being dislocated from place. I was with a bunch of people that were basically earnest and basically honest and the kind of paranoia that was introduced by drugs it was so destructive in our ability to communicate with each other and it really saddened me. And then at some point we all just stopped.
when Rolling Stone was ready to put Linda Ronstadt on the cover, that was her absolute peak up till then. Generally, it was a very male-oriented, denim-clad warrior cover. So here comes Linda Ronstadt, and she and Annie Leibovitz put together this photo session that was like no other cover that had been on Rolling Stone before. She was honest and opened her heart. She said, this gets lonely and I don't know where it ends up. It's an emotional journey and I'm happy that I brought this kind of joy. But you know what, when I'm here alone in this Malibu home that looks very cozy, it's lonely. There's a lot of show business people down here, you know. It's not my style exactly. Where did you live before? Nowhere, really. I was on the road, you know, for about 10 years and I didn't exactly have a home. I remember my dad was watching her at the game. She sang the national anthem. What so proudly we hail at the twilight. And all of a sudden, there she is. She'd come in the limo straight to the restaurant from the game to have something to eat. My parents had a small restaurant on Melrose Avenue across the street from what was then KHJ Radio, which was the radio station in the day. Lindy walked in, and my dad was wearing a shirt that we call in Mexico a guayabera, and it has four pockets, and it's white. And she said, this is a good place, because he's wearing the shirt my dad wears. A lot of the people who hung out at the Troubadour also hated Lucy's. Lucy was very, shall we say, loose with the check now and again if we were on hard times. Our customers were not just the soon-to-be celebrities of the industries. They were the old guard of Los Angeles. I mean, you're talking old school money. There was a big communal table that my father used to sit everybody at. So you'd sit with policemen, you'd sit with firemen, sometimes you'd sit with an actor, sometimes you'd sit, I mean, a football player. You never had any idea who you'd sit with. What happened was Linda had decided that she wanted to change the 8-track because she wanted to hear something else. So she had to step up on this little wine rack. And at that moment, the governor, Jerry Brown, comes in that room and he sees her. And it was like, wow, who is she? So my father went and he sat them together. And, well, he fell in love with her. There was no question about that. Gary likes passionate music. He likes passionate music, passionate women. You know, that's his deal. We had a really good time together. He went out to run for president for the last couple of months and had been for the fact that I got to see him on TV every night. I forgot what he looked like. So, but he came back yesterday. He's going to make it all better now. So he told me anyway. I've yet to see. My boyfriend's back and you're gonna be in trouble. And I, and I, my boyfriend's back. Did you have much of a problem uh, when you were with Jerry Brown, people expecting you to have uh, political views along the lines of, uh, of Governor Brown's? Whereas, I mean, you're a Our singer, he's a politician. Our relationship was completely personal. It wasn't political at all. So, you know, he did politics, I did music. Right. It's, it's easy to separate that. <laughs> now, you went to South Africa recently. Uh, did you receive criticism for going there? As far as I was concerned, it was just a gig. I don't think that if you disagree with the policies of, of the government, which I do very definitely disagree with the policies of the South African government, I don't think that's enough of a reason not to go and play music there. If I, if I did that, I wouldn't be able to play in the United States because I don't agree with their policies about nuclear power and nuclear warfare. I mean, my God, we've got this person running the country, you know, that I completely disagree with. <laughs> if I decided that I wasn't going to play where attitudes of racism prevailed, I certainly couldn't play in Australia or England or 
uh, lots of places in the United States, a lot, a lot of places in the American South, or Boston, which is extremely racist. I went to South Africa, has a fascist repressive government. Mm. I'm very interested in the culture. You just got finished talking, you say, why does anyone think I'm controversial? Do you realize what you've just talked about here? We've just received all your political views in one blow. I'm not, I'm teasing. I'm not putting it down, honestly. Very, I don't think my political views are very controversial. Who, who likes nuclear warfare? I remember her having the Wall Street Journal in her bag one time in the 70s when she was dating Jerry and I went, you know, I, I thought she was really smart, but she's really well read and very, very up on a lot of different things. She's as wide ranging in her critical intellectual pursuits as she is in her musical pursuits. And, and you don't find that kind of depth and eclecticism in pop music. Jerry needed somebody that could be full time there for him. You couldn't have two careers in that family. I never will marry. There's not enough time. I'll be no man's wife. I intend to stay single for the rest of my life. Probably the same reason I never got married. I don't know. I think it's hard being a woman in the music business. You know, it's. It's a different kind of life. Well, you don't need to get married, you know what I mean? It's like we have our own income, and you don't have to have the state um, verify that you love somebody, and when that relationship's over, you leave. Neither one of us are really made for marriage or, I think, long-term relationships. So why, why did you break up? I have, can't remember. Maybe she could tell you. My mom wanted to be a scientist, but she had four kids, and I think that it was always a little bit of a disappointment. She always said to me, go out and have a life, you know, you don't just have to get married, there are alternatives. I have to confess, I got a really bad crush on this guy. We had a little romance for a while, but it, it wasn't long-lived. He, he dumped me for this pig. Well, at least I got his picture. Does he love me? I want to know. How can I tell if he loves me so? Yes, he didn't get inside. Oh, no, you make believe. Yes, he didn't get inside. Oh, no, you be deceived if you sure, want. in rock and pop are Teddy Pendergrass and Tanya Taka. The nominees are Linda Ronstadt, <laughs> Miss Barbara Streisand, oh. and Donna Summer. Can you open the door? I'm too nervous. I'll do the journaly thing here and I'll <laughs> open it if you will read. Okay, and the winner is Linda Ronstadt. Linda was the queen. She was like what Beyonce is now. She was the first female rock and roll star. She was the only female artist to have five platinum albums in a row, and most of them multi platinum. Favorite country single, Blue Bayou by Linda Ronstadt. And the winner is Payton Dunwin. Linda Ronstadt. The winner is Linda Ronstadt. You make the when you are there on you. Give us something to the forward to. Remember all of the girls you win. The nature of being a pop musician is that you get these things that are successful and you have to sing them for the rest of your life. Over and over and over again, they start sounding like your washing machine. I didn't like singing in the big arenas because the sound was like, you know, 
you'd hear the guitar solo that they played last week still ringing around the Raptors. So I started looking for other things to do. There is this feeling that she has about the music itself rather than the career itself. You know, some people are just hardcore careerists. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's how your mind works that makes the difference. It's your, how you see yourself or how you see yourself in the world, you know? And not everybody's a pure art for art's sake and not everybody's a pure careerist either, especially in music because musicians love music or they wouldn't do it. She wanted to change. She got tired of doing arena rock. She wanted to try different things. I picked up the phone and called my great friend John Rockwell, who writes music criticism for the New York Times. I said, I hate playing these big sporting arenas. It's not good for the audience. It's not good for the band. I want to sing in a theater with a proscenium and a curtain. He said, well, the next time you come to New York, I'll take you down and meet this fellow named Joseph Papp. He has a theater it's called the New York Public Theater, and he does Shakespeare, and he does musicals. He did hair. He wanted to do the Pirates of Penzance. My mom was a Gilbert and Sullivan lover. She had a big book of Gilbert and Sullivan songs on the piano. And I actually learned all the soprano parts as a kid. And I loved singing them. But I never got a chance to in rock and roll. That was in her roots. That was in her upbringing. It was part of her authentic musical experience. Jill called me and said, if I wanted to do the part, I could have it. And I said, no, I have to come and audition, because I didn't know whether I could sing it or not. She wanted to be certain that she would, would do it well. They thought that being able to say Linda Ronstadt's in it would be good for business. But her concern was, well, will it be good for the show? I was there for several rehearsals, and she was fabulous. She just grabbed it by the horns and... That was the first job I was ever offered where I actually got to sing like that. I was delighted, I really was. But I can't do it very well yet. Because it's really hard, you can't learn that overnight. You gotta so be we'll in see. training. In training, yep. Linda had a great voice, and she had a great vision for herself. And she didn't want to just be singing rock and roll, she wanted to do everything. Hold monsters, there you pirate caravansary proceed against our will to wed us all. Just bear in mind that we are wards in chancery, and father is a major general. I knew some of her songs, sure, but, um, operetta? Prepare, unhappy General Stanley. A week into rehearsal, we all sang through the score, just sitting in a circle on chairs. And when I heard her voice, it was just this bel canto, soprano, gorgeous, musical, celestial, yet earthy, just pure. It was somebody so pure, it just made me cry. I just remember just listening to that, that voice. It was just singing that stuff. Touching. Oh, sisters, death to pity's name for shame. It's true that he has gone astray, but pray. Is that a reason good and true why you should all be deaf to pity's name? Gilbert and Sullivan? Really? <laughs> a rock star who has the guts to go out there and do that kind of musical comedy. She just didn't care. To her, it was like a, th a, a mountain to climb. Linda can bring herself to sing anything. She could sing opera. She could do anything with her voice. I couldn't do all that. Kevin Klein and I were both nominated for Tony Awards for that show. 
Kevin deserved it more than I did. All I did was walk around and sing. My mom died during Pirates of Penzance. I wasn't with her when she died. And I just couldn't quite get it through my head that she was gone out of the world and I was never going to see her again. She had all these records, Louis Armstrong, Ella Fitzgerald, Billie Holiday, Peggy Lee. And I thought, oh, I'd like to try to sing some of those songs. Only the lonely ghost. When we lived together, almost every evening, the last record we listened to it was a Frank Sinatra album called Songs for Only the Lonely, with Nelson Riddle Cafe. arranging. Constantly, people were telling Linda, you can't do this. I'm guilty. When she was going to do the Nelson Riddle album, I, I didn't think it was a good idea, not because she couldn't do it, but because we had this run going with rock and roll records and country rock. I said, I'd like to find somebody that can write arrangements like Nelson Riddle. He said, why don't you just ask Nelson Riddle? Well, I didn't know he was still alive. You were the only person that I knew that could, that could do orchestrations mm -hmm. like this. I didn't know where you were, whether you'd be interested in working with me, whether you'd ever heard of me or not. And as soon as I started learning the songs, I just, they, they just got inside me. I, I wanted to record them, and I wanted to do it worse than anything I've ever wanted to do. I remember so, your phrase for this. You said, you said, these are songs I cannot not do. I can't not do them. I mean, at some point, it's like falling in love. You know, it's, choice doesn't even enter into it. What's new? I would think, well, my God, how can I sing these songs? Ella Fitzgerald has sung them, Billie Holiday has sung them, Frank Sinatra has sung them. Handsome as ever. She studied all of those records and she studied every available version she could find of each one of those songs. She is a real student. What's new? She told me she wanted to get those songs out of the elevator, by which she meant that that's the only place you heard them. And she wanted to point out that that's not where they belong, that they were some of the best songs ever written. What am I, asking what's new? I went to her house and tried to talk her out of it, but as soon as she told me Nelson Riddle was going to do it, I said, well, I'd like to come to the record session. My sister was in high school. She got to go to her senior prom. She got to wear these strapless dresses with a lot of tulle. And I always wanted one of those dresses. But by the time I got to high school, the styles had changed and I never got to have one. So I said, I'm going to put a show together. We're all going to get to wear those dresses. Tonight. We have three marvelous singers on the show, and would you know how many times they have been nominated for Grammys between them? Forty-five times the total. <laughs> wow. And in the albums they've all sold are in the multi-millions, and uh, I guess it's taken the ladies about ten years to get this together, where they wanted to work together, and uh, made an album called Trio, and it was well worth the time. The album is described as old-timey, but it's sensational. Would you welcome Linda Ronstadt, Dolly Parton, Emmy Lou Hare. <laughs> I met Dolly, um, I saw her singing on the Grand Ole Opry, and she was a wonder to behold. I mean, what you have in front of you is one of the most beautiful girls you've ever seen. You know, she's just gorgeous. When she opened her mouth and started to sing, I fell on the floor. She's an amazing singer. Jolene, 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 I'm begging of you, please don't take my man. I told Emmy Lou about her. And then Emmy met her somehow. When I made my first trip to Nashville, the powers that be set up a meeting with Dolly, and she was 
making a record in her studio, and it was like unbelievable. It was better than any Disneyland visit. They kind of found my music somewhere and kind of wanted to meet me, and that's kind of how we all started. Amy called me up. She said, Dolly Parton's at my house. You have to come over. I was living like 40 minutes away, and I got there in 20 minutes. She came over, and there we were, the three of us, and we were there with our idol, Dolly. And they had this big old house, almost like a bunch of hippies, just living up there, you know, different people, the musicians, they had different bedrooms. It was just a free-for-all kind of house, a dream for musicians. And uh, somebody said, well, sing something. <laughs> Bury me beneath the willow, under the weeping willow tree, so he may know where I am sleeping, and perhaps he'll weep for me. So I started singing that, and they, then they started saying, sing that again. And I goes, oh, bury me. And here come all these harmonies, and oh, it was just chilling, chilling, chilling. Beneath the willow, under the weeping willow tree. heard our voices, it was like injecting some kind of serum into your veins. It was like a high like you've never felt. We sang first in a living room and said, well, this sounds really good. It was and, special. Uh, it was different. It was special. It was like, uh, like a, a sister, a sound of sisters, musical sisters. Won't you bear? moment we thought we have to do a record. To know, know, know is to love, love, love. Just to see you smile makes my life worthwhile. To know, know. We learn so much about singing from each other because you get to sort of be them for a second when you're shadowing them in harmony. And you, you get to have like a, it's like getting on an eagle and getting to see the world from that, through that eagle's experience. You know, I get to sing through Dolly's voice or sing through Emmy's voice when I sing real close harmony. The only big disagreements would be, are we going to use auto harp or dulcimer on this song. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we would disagree about who would sing lead because Emmy and I always wanted Dolly to sing lead on yeah. everything. You know, we'd go, oh, well, Dolly will sound great on that, you know. Like, you sing lead, no, you sing lead. Linda is such a perfectionist. She's a pain in the ass sometimes because she is such a perfectionist because she will not have it unless it's perfect. She used to make me sing that those harmonies over and over and over, and I said, I'm going to sing it the same way that no matter what. No, you're not. You're going to hit this one note. And see, I don't know how to all those intricate harmonies like Amy Lou and Linda do. I just sing that raw stuff from feeling, and it ain't always proper, but it sounds good. rock and roll, pop. Uh, what's your next project going to be? I'm going to do uh, an album of Mexican music, of traditional Mexican music. I'm, I'm kind of a traditional Mexican myself. You know, I grew up about 40 minutes from the Mexican border. My family are Mexican, and that, that is my roots. That's what I came from. And I, I have been dying to do this record for years and years, and I'm getting around to it this year. Boy, I'm going to do it. Intensa nostalgia in body, mi pensamiento. Our neighbor that lived behind us in the garage apartment was Harry Dean Stanton, great character actor, and a great singer of Mexican folk songs. We would hear him up till the wee hours singing these Mexican folk songs, these canciones. And um, Linda knew all those songs. I don't think people thought of her as, uh, as Mexican. It certainly never came up. I never heard it. I mean, the name Ronstadt is not Hernandez. Ronstadt is a German sounding name. No, she's, she's certainly from Mexican heritage, but it's not, it wasn't the most apparent thing. You know what? Yeah. I don't want to see where you put your D. Say, ganador. Uh -huh. 
Ganador. 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 Do. Is it up on the roof of your mouth or back of your teeth? Do. When he asked me if I would sing a harmony on his record, I was completely delighted because you can only learn by doing. You know, I can't. Uh, there isn't a book you can get, you know, say, how do you learn how to be a singer in Spanish? And it's always been a dream of mine to make an album of these Mexican songs that I learned from my father. <laughs> My father had a beautiful baritone voice. He sounded like a cross between Pedro Infante and Frank Sinatra. Always, you know, if there was a dinner party or something, he'd get the guitar out and then he'd just sing. And then I always would fall asleep in somebody's lap listening to my dad sing some beautiful song. We always, as a family, we always sang in Spanish, even though I didn't understand much of what I was singing. It was something that I learned to do. It's kind of like lip reading, you know. I used to kind of chameleon in harmony along with my father. To learn to sing that style as a grown-up professional singer, that took some doing. Vamos. I always forget the beginning when Vamos. I go through the ending. Fight, fight, it's fight, so fight, hard. Fight. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, wait, was it this way? Is that how you do it? The Latin way. Okay, Vaya. I got it. Sí, ya está, olvídate. Uh -huh. Okay, I'm learning all these new things. My dad invited me to go to the Tucson Mariachi Conference, and that way I got to meet the Mariachi Vargas. Those good bands like the Cobre or the Camperos or the Mariachi Vargas, you're going to go to a symphony and you're not going to find better musicians. They're all virtuoso players. I picked a couple of songs. The band said, these songs are very traditional and they're very difficult to do. I said, well, it's the only songs I know, so we better learn them. I went to the president of my record company, who's a man who genuinely likes music, and I said, look, I've made all these records for you, they've sold this, I'm going to do this just for me, you know, and this might be self-indulgent. If it sells two copies, I don't care, but if I can't record this music, I'm going to die. I don't understand any Spanish. I didn't understand how popular those songs were, but this is a uh, lady who wanted to do it her way, and who was going to say no? Yeah. Canciones de mi padre. It's the largest selling Spanish language album in the history of the industry. That's the whole Linda Ronstadt story right there in a nutshell. Linda deciding she wants to do something. The record company is telling her she can't. She goes ahead and does it anyway, and they jump on board as the thing starts to take off. Toda la familia would come, and they loved it because they were here from Mexico. Even though their kids had grown up here and become American citizens, who is this girl singing songs so beautifully? The fact that she went on and did that and did it in such a big way, that was a brave thing to do. Many people would have been terrified, I'll mess up my career, you know. But obviously she had purpose, personal decision. It's good. 
viejo que huele a surco y a tradición Revelada la faena más arbitrada de mi nación Bonito es el caripeo y cuando su animación Yo quiero montarle un toro para que me mire mi amor Upali 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 Yo quiero montarle un toro para que me mire mi amor Ay, ay To have that traditionalism going along on the bus with me from town to town, where I'd only sung pop music, to take that part of the dirt with me, you know, the part of the soil of the land where I came from, to Cleveland and Cincinnati and New York, that was a thrill. You should have seen Central Park with, you know, close to a million people in it. When the mariachi got up on stage with their big hats, the place fell out. They went nuts, you know. There was such a thing of pride that went, up, went from the stage to the audience. It was just great. This song uh, uh, was written by me and my father, and it's called Lo Siento Mi Vida. Lo siento mi vida. My dad died when he was 84. There was a kind of a peace that happened when he died. In the three or four days before he died, he was reading to us passages from Gabriel Garcia Marquez's book, Love in the Time of Cholera. And it was just a great sharing. It was a different experience being with my father when he died than it was with my mother. I knew I was going to miss him, but I, I accepted it better. Siempre se he had what I would describe as a beautiful death. She's so down to earth and, you know, girl next door thing, you know, and just humble. She was just a sweet, humble person. I'd been in New Orleans for the World's Fair, and somebody said, well, the Neville Brothers are playing at some club down in the quarter. We should go. We're going to get serious, serious right now. I'm going to turn you on to the, our brother Aaron Neville. Aaron Neville was on stage singing this beautiful song, Ariane. Ariane. Somebody told me she was in the audience, so I called up on stage, sing some doo -wop. Usually I'll never do anything like that, because I like to rehearse everything first. But I wasn't going to say no to Aaron Neville. After that, I asked for an autograph. She said, to Aaron, love, I'll sing with you anytime, any place, anywhere, in any key. Look at this face. The next morning I woke up and my first thought was, boy, I like singing with Aaron Neville. That sounded pretty good. And then I thought, you idiot, everybody sounds good when they're singing with Aaron Neville. I still don't know where it's going. I said, we got to make a record together. And he was up for it. I don't know much. But I know I love you And that may be all I need to know They had all kind of rumors going on on that one. Tell me. <laughs> they said, oh, Linda and Aaron got married or whatever, and it was crazy stuff. Look at these dreams, so big and so big. The producer told us, if you don't make it look real, there ain't no sense doing it. So, you know, they had to make it look real. That may be all there is to know. At the studio, I said, see you at the Grammys. Uh, I'm, an, I'm, an, I'm an. <laughs> too nervous. I just want to say thank you to Linda first and my wife Joelle. Aaron and I won two Grammys for that record. And God, Saint Jude. But as time went on, there was something really wrong with my voice. I just lost a lot of different colors in my voice. 
There's a lot of things you do in singing. You turn your voice to different planes to make different sounds, and I couldn't do any of that. Turned out I had Parkinson's disease. Singing is really complex, and I was made most aware of it by having it vanish. But I can still sing in my mind, but I can't do it physically. I sang my last concert on November 7th, 2009. It was a Mexican show. Must have been quite a, quite a reckoning to have this marvelous instrument that could always hold the notes, hit the notes, and shape the notes, could no longer hold the notes without quaver. But there's a lot of good records with her magnificent voice on them, and I, I, I hear her laughing in my head all the time. I hear that cackle all the time, so I'm sort of never without her. I can imagine that not being able to sing for Linda is awful. But I also know of nobody who could handle that kind of change or adjustment in a more logical and thoughtful and intelligent way than Linda. I don't think she misses going on the road. I don't think she misses making records. I think she misses singing with her friends and singing in the living room with her family. There's just no one on the planet that ever had or ever will have a voice like Linda's. You know, I'm grateful for the time I had. I got to live a lot of my dreams, and I, I feel lucky about it. Another person with Parkinson said that life after death isn't the question. It's life before death. So how are you going to do it? How are you going to live? Not my speaking range anymore. <laughs> you said before you said you couldn't sing anymore. This isn't really singing. Believe me, it's a few notes sketched in, but it's not really singing. Are you enjoying it? Well, I would enjoy it much more if I could sing, but I can't let them sing this without me. <laughs> it's a family thing. Shall we? Yeah. You guys ready? <laughs> Do 
we get to eat? Yeah. Yes. Oh, good. 